in this episode of Investors and Operators, I sit down with Emily McMahon and Sherman Williams, the co-founders of Academy Investor Network, AIN. Sherman and I were kind of colleagues while you're at William Blair and I was at BDA. Uh, we, we, we got to work with each other on deals and, uh, and we also know each other through the nonprofit space and kind of working with transitioning veterans. And so I thought it would be awesome to kind of highlight the amazing stuff that they're doing with entrepreneurs, service academy grads in the, in the venture space. Uh, so Sherman, over to you, um, maybe a little background on your story and what you guys are up to with AIN. And then uh, Emily, over to you after that. Yeah, so really quickly, thank you, Jordan. Um, really quickly. Naval Academy graduate, class of 2003, got out the military in 2010 to go to the University of Chicago booth. From there, I went into, uh, was interested in venture, also interested uh, in just finance in general, but mainly venture. But I knew I needed to uh, get my feet wet. So I did that in investment banking, did that at William Blair uh, and a couple of other investment banks, and then transitioned uh, to uh, venture full time and, and then subsequently to, the, to start Academy Investment Network with Emily. So thanks so much for having us. Uh, my name is Emily McMahon. I am a 2001 uh, West Point grad, and I was an active duty MP with lots of great post 9-11 deployments. Uh, I was very lucky to get out and connect with a government contracting startup and was able to help grow that. And then was so inspired by my experience working within the veteran startup community here in Washington, D.C., that I used that experience to start a military veteran-focused incubator in the D.C. area for the last seven years, and then recently teamed up with Sherman um, to start the Academy Investor Network, which is an investment syndicate uh, designed to syndicate capital from the graduates of the five publicly funded service academies. That's awesome. How did you guys come up with this idea? How did you get to where you're at now? How long you've been, how, have you been doing this? Yeah. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I was lucky enough to go to uh, one of the early conferences focused on entrepreneurs from uh, West Point back in 2018, which brought together just a fantastic group of entrepreneurs, investors, service academy leaders um, talking about, you know, what are we doing to support service academy grads in this space, both with respect to capital and also entrepreneurship. Um, and so this idea has been around for a while, just in terms of, you know, how are we exposing more grads to the venture asset class? How are we doing, you know, what are we doing more to bring this community together um, and, and be on par with other grads from other top tier institutions and expose them uh, to this venture asset class? And so that's sort of the initial genesis of how this was formed. And Sherman and I are kind of just taking this concept and running with it, um, kind of on the backs of, of, that, uh, of that group. So. Thanks. Sherman, how, how, how far are you guys into it? How many years? What are some facts and figures that we can throw out there? Yeah, so we actually incorporated the organization in January of this year before COVID. Uh, everything is BCAC B, B, these days, right? Uh, <laughs> so that's when we did that. We actually um, publicly launched this around Memorial Day of, of this year, 2020. Uh, time stamped this for, for the future years. We started recruiting the, like the syndicate members, et cetera, like pretty much the beginning of June. Uh, we now have just shy of 200 syndicate members. We've closed out on uh, our initial deal. We're about to close out on our second deal. And we think we may have identified uh, a couple of great candidates for our, our third deal. And we were able to raise money from a larger venture, early stage venture fund uh, into AIN. And we also raised money from several high net worth Academy graduates into AIN to support our operating um, function. function. So what's but the we, average check size that, you know, if you're going after a service Academy grads, you want them in the syndicate, you know, what do they need to know? What's the average check size that they are putting in the range, the average, as well as when you're making investments, you know, the entrepreneurs, what's the usual range? How do you think about that? Got it. So we tell the entrepreneurs first that we'll probably via the syndicate be able to bring fifty and two hundred thousand dollars into each deal. Okay, the minimum check size for academy grads is three thousand dollars. The average check size thus far has been five thousand dollars. We we really encourage about ten thousand dollar checks from accredited investors. 
So that's the thought process. We encourage all of our investors, you know, venture should be probably about five to 10% of your portfolio. And we want you to invest into about 15 to 20 companies alongside of us over the next four to five years. So you can backfill that math as far as the total of what you'd be outlaying. We are also raising a dedicated fund uh, for AIN and that fund will, will invest alongside the syndicate and will bring much more capital to each uh, entrepreneur than, than, than what the syndicate does. What's the um, process like, Emily, when you meet an academy grad, they want to become part of the syndicate. What yeah. does that look like from kind of soup to nuts? Yeah. So, you know, we're doing a lot of outreach right now. So I think that's kind of like one of our, our key asks. So if you are a service academy grad, please go to our website, um, academyinvestornetwork.com um, and, and reach out to Sherman and me. Really, it's kind of getting getting to know the grad. What are they looking to do with AIN, both in terms of investing, like what's of interest to them? What's their background? Um, that's one of the things that's really, um, I think, a differentiator amongst our community. We have all in some shape or form served um, in the military. So we all have a pretty robust background in terms of working with technology, working with the government. Um, and then I think the second piece is understanding like how do they wanna give back? So much of what Sherman and I are doing is about you know, helping, helping to you know, syndicate capital for these companies, but there's a whole other layer of this in terms of this network. So the capital component, but then also like what can we do for each of these companies as a result of this network. So we also really wanna know like what's of interest to these grads, is it serving on boards? Is it helping with recruiting? Is it giving back? So um, that's a lot of the process is just getting to know each of these grads with respect to their background, what's important to them um, and how we can ultimately incorporate them and you know, what's, what's most important, so. The, the website again is academyinvestor.com. That's, okay. the, that's the website, academyinvestor.com. Thanks, Sharm. Sure. Okay. Awesome. So let's go maybe to a, a higher level question, which is like, why are you doing this? What, what's, the, what's the foundational reason, the reason why you're willing to, you know, break down walls to make sure that this comes to fruition? What is your why? And I'll uh, start off with Emily and then turn. Yeah. So I have been a part of this space now in a very concentrated manner for the last seven years. And so I'm really excited about becoming even more focused with respect to helping um, high growth companies um, and having them backed by service academy grads. And my in my uh, prior experience, one of the things that I just kept seeing was so many service ag academy grads stepping up and helping a lot of the military veteran entrepreneurs that I was working with. There's a real like nexus of just interest and support in helping these grads. And I realized like there's nothing, there's nothing um, kind of oriented towards these grads with respect to investing um, like, like I'd like to see, both in terms of the community and also just like the actual access to capital. And so I'm really passionate about it because I think it's just an extension of this great community, both with respect to, again, capital and network. And I think we really can be on par with a lot of the other efforts um, that are happening at other top tier institutions. That's sure. awesome. How about you? <laughs> yeah, so um, my reasons were, uh, I'll, give a, I'll give a backstory and it all wrapped together. But for me, um, I only went into banking to learn, right? I wanted to learn as much as I could, as fast as humanly possible. I graduated business school. I was 32 years old, right? So I, you know, all my 20s completely gone. Um, I just, you know, a lot of my peers, they had, you know, gone into banking as analysts at 22. I'm, I'm 32 at this point. I'm, I'm almost the age of some of the partners when I first started banking. I knew that I wanted to, after learning, I wanted to find a way to kind of give back and not kind of be back to completely give back, I should say. So impact investing was something that was heavily on my mind um, as I was moving into VC and out of banking. That's, that's something that I wanted to do. And I saw this as an excellent way to make an impact on a community that I care about, on the community that I come from, uh, the service academy community and the, and the veteran community in, in general. Uh, so that's why I decided I wanted to like run with this. And then also I see that the, as far as generational wealth being created, um, I, I don't, a lot of academy grads are not, are not at that the forefront necessarily in that early stage veteran, uh, early stage venture ecosystem. And we can really be helpful there, um, kind of bridging that gap. So that's the reason why I wanted to do this. 
So you guys are both entrepreneurs officially. <laughs> How has the entrepreneurial journey been? <laughs> Yeah, I think it's been good. I mean, I, I, I feel like I keep, uh, I keep getting connected to these early stage organizations. And I personally love it. Um, it's been great working with Sherm. Um, I think we have a great relationship and uh, great balance in terms of, you know, our, our role um, as co-founders and sort of just kind of the day-to-day -day operation. Um, but yeah, I think it's definitely uh, you know, similar to a lot of journeys with respect to startups and sort of the ups and downs and just the drive. Wait, there are downs? <laughs> Who would have thought, right? What? But, yeah, especially, <laughs> you know, as, as Sherman mentioned, like, you know, starting this and launching this during COVID, I think is definitely something, you know, you got to have a strong stomach just to kind of keep persevering. But I think Sherman and I have been there before. This is sort of part of our DNA and fabric at this point. And so... Um, I, I think it's sort of par for the course in terms of our past experience. Well, on that note, what do you think is one of the most difficult times that you've been through and maybe kind of like your story of perseverance? 23 years old, I graduated the academy, got sick, went to NAS Jax, um, the Naval Hospital Jacksonville. They told me it was flu poisoning, threw up the pills while I was at the hospital. Luckily, I was... Uh, had a good, really good friend, went back to their place, ended up being taken back to the hospital two days, like a day later or whatever. Appendix had burst, pretty much almost died, was in the hospital for a month, almost got booted from the Navy, recovered physically, made deployment. That was pretty, it, it got real. Went to, went to the ICU a couple of times and recovered. And uh, yeah, that was probably <laughs> the, the most difficult thing that I've uh, probably ever been through myself as well. Emily, what about you? Yeah, I think for me, it's, I, I can't think of one like specific incident, but I, I feel like every time I'm in a startup, I always, I always face this point where I kind of feel like, okay, I don't know what I'm doing at this point. I've got to figure this out. And inevitably I don't. And then all, I feel like there's always this moment where someone will come into my path and just sort of an opportunity will like abound from that experience. And so I feel like my kind of lowest moments are the, the moments where I feel like I'm sort of at the end of my rope in terms of either experience or intellect or what, what have you be. And, and then someone will come in and sort of just show me like, one, I don't have to do it by myself. And also it's very humbling just to see how many really smart hardworking people there are out there. And so I always believe that it's not, you know, there's, there's, there's no shortage of well-educated, you know, just experienced, hardworking people, but it's those opportunities that when they connect and you really resonate with someone, like that's, those are sort of the moments where I feel like I go from low kind of on up. So, and that's happened quite a bit to me. So in, in terms of just connecting with the right people. Well, it's so exciting to hear that you guys are up to almost 200 people in the syndicate now. And especially in this environment, you know, any business that is still going, it's yeah. uh, it's an incredible feat. And just to go take the plunge in entrepreneurship and do it, you know, in this in this kind of environment, um, you know, what what would be kind of your parting advice for the entrepreneurs out there who, you know, we've covered the service academy grads and looking at that side of the network, but what about the the entrepreneurs out there and like how should they think about? Um, you know, you as a resource for them. Yeah, so I think pick something, pick it, whatever you decide to do, realize that's probably going to be a seven to 10 year journey. Um, realize that in the first, you know, three to five years, you probably will not be appropriately compensated uh, per your like, you know, education level, et cetera. Meaning you can go get a job somewhere else and make more money if you work for someone else. Um, so I think you need to, understand that, um, but pick something that you really care about and really want to do. I'll use the analogy of, you're right, we are entrepreneurs starting AI and particularly during COVID. It hasn't been necessarily wildly difficult from my perspective, because Emily can tell you, I love venture. I wanted to be a venture capitalist since I was a spec war unit one in a tent in Korea, I remember. <laughs> I've wanted to be in venture for so long. So I'm, I'm very passionate about it. And that makes the, the journey a, a bit easier. It makes, you know, smooths out the downs, definitely. You know, the other thing I would tell them, particularly for the veterans out there, we have this thing, I, I don't know how they do in the army, but it's pretty big in the Navy. Uh, we call it Message Garcia. I don't, I don't know if they use that in other services, but um, it's basically 
you will figure it out, right? And I literally take that, I've, I've taken Mr. Garcia since I was, you know, 17 years old at the academy. You find a way, you have the skill sets, right? Or you need to go out and develop the, some baseline skill sets. And from there, you don't quit. That's number one. You never, ever quit and you just figure it out. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're passionate about what you're doing also, then you should be, uh, you should be okay. And as far as using us as a resource, we have 200 service academy graduates from all five services, West Point, Air Force, Navy, Coast Guard, and Merchant Marines, okay? That's the power. We've got astronauts, we've got pilots, we've got Marines, we've got SEALs, we've got submariners, et cetera, that can help, that, can, that all have experience outside of the military, a lot of, most of them, that can be helpful to you. Um, so that's, you can use this as a resource, particularly um, civilian and dual use tech, if you are that, uh, building a dual use tech company, as far as how to uh, penetrate the government, et cetera, you can utilize us. And if you're a veteran, you just want that mentorship, being a veteran, starting a company, to talk to other veterans and be part of a trusted network. Um, I think that's a, we, we are a great resource for that. Yeah. A couple thoughts too. I, I think it just in terms of, um, you know, really emphasize on the problem you're trying to solve and is a problem we're solving. So it might be something, it might be a problem you're solving, but it might not be scalable. Um, it's really the first thing. So just continue to emphasize that. And I think the second piece of that is that you're always working for somebody. So as an entrepreneur, it, it's not about you. It really is about the person you're trying to solve the person, the problem for. And that's usually always a very external, it's, it's just a life of being externally focused to you know, solving problems for people. So I think that's a second piece. Um, and then just to piggyback Sherman's great comment there. Yeah, I, I love it when somebody has very, has, has pretty like well thought out um, asks from us because sometimes it's hard. Well, we're happy to do it, but like, the more specific people can be with their asks, I think it just helps the conversation go that much quicker in terms of those types of connections. But obviously we're always happy to work with people too um, that maybe don't know that. But I think knowing uh, knowing like what, what your ask might be of Sherman and me and the community is always really helpful um, and very well received. Mark and Zach, can you kind of give your, your high level background, you know, 15, 20 seconds. And then it'd be great to hear uh, Emily and Sherman's advice kind of for where you're at in your transition, kind of how to best navigate that. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Mark, you want to shoot? Yes, I'll take it. Uh, graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy in 2009. Spent the majority of my time in San Diego with uh, the SEAL teams. Got out in 2018 to go back to school full-time at the Wharton School for the MBA program finished up this last May. And since then I've interned at a first raise venture capital fund and a seed stage real estate FinTech startup. From North Carolina, currently living in San Diego, undergrad in advertising marketing, been in the teams for around nine, eight, nine years right now. Um, have about a year left. Currently MBA at Anderson at UCLA and looking at options in private equity, whether it be uh, lower middle market, just exactly roles and responsibilities, whether it's the, uh, the business development side, the analysis side, or the operation side. So I'm just trying to figure out best fit and, and also own a, own a business, which is what sort of direct me towards the route of uh, private equity. So. Awesome. Can you give maybe Zach some thoughts in terms of banking first or trying to go buy side or even going venture and or working in early stage companies. And actually, I think it's applicable to, to, to both Mark and Zach. Can you kind of lay out just since you have been on the banking side and now you're on the venture side, you've seen the private equity ecosystem, some high level thoughts that people can be thinking through and trying to navigate that and whether or not it is worth the probability whether or not it's worth it in just the job, the comp and just the lifestyle, you know, you've been through that Great to hear, kind of hear your advice. Yeah, let me let me jump onto that real quick, Sherman, before you answer, just a little bit more specific guidance, because I'm trying to, That's I appreciate you bringing that up, Jordan. That's something I'm really sort of wrestling with, just age-wise, like you said. You know, you got in around, or got out around like 32-ish, and I'm in the same, similar boat, give or take a few years, and just that, that fit, right? Because we're in a weird stage where we have all this life experience, we have school experience, but, you know, we're going to be surrounded by peers that are, you know, 10 years younger than us. 
and that's okay, but you know, is it, is it more of, Hey, I should focus all my energy and effort getting into venture, getting into private equity or, you know, pay the traditional dues of getting into banking, spending a few years there and then transitioning. Uh, And if you think one route's necessarily worth it over the other. So the reality, the great thing about jobs, a lot of things, you only need one person to say yes. (laughs) So, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of firms and funds out there that's, but then when you start talking about probabilities, you know, getting, it, it depends on what you want to do in private equity. If you want to be an investment partner or you want to be an operating partner, if you want to be an investing partner, and there's also biz dev, there's also biz dev in private equity. So if you want to be on the uh, investment partner side, there's a certain skills, there's certain skill sets that you need that are typically developed as an analyst in investment banking. So then you would need to go that route. And it's basically financial modeling. And so that's, that's kind of that. So you it would probably, now, again, you only need one person to say yes, and you wouldn't, you could forego that, but it's highly likely, you know, that you will need to do some time as an investment banker, probably one to two years to make the move to private equity. The issue is that private equity is onboarded best as an analyst, so post undergrad, not post MBA. Okay. So that increases the, the level of difficulty even higher. But again, all you need is one person to say yes. I'm an optimistic person, right? I think that, um, you know, it's, 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 it's quite difficult um, from where you're at unless you're able to truly specialize in something. Like if you went into a private equity firm that specializes in rolling up aerospace and defense companies, you may be a, you may be a, a great candidate for an investment partner role. Then there's operating partner role. Operating partner role, you need to get some operational experience, right? So you need to, you would want to go to a, a private equity backed company in an operational role, right? So that's yet another, another thing you can do. And eventually you can go back up to that private equity firm and, and, and work with them and, and be parachuted into different companies or help them plan out how to deal with certain, how to, how to a way forward for, for some of these companies and help with hiring, et cetera. And then BizDev is basically going out and finding companies that they could potentially invest in, right? Um, just kind of help, help from, a, from a deal sourcing deal flow standpoint from, uh, as far as biz dev. Yes, you, you're, and, and the reality of it is I, I never, I've literally believe I can do almost anything in the world. Like I, 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 I'm an optimistic person. I put my mind to it. I can make things happen. I think we were all, you know, kind of that way in alpha in that sense, but there's just a reality in finance. They've been doing this for a long time, man, right? And they just have, this is when they onboard People on board of private equity from analysts. It is what it is. And you're competing against a lot of people that have a lot more experience than you if you are trying to do it as a post-MBA. Because remember, some of those people were analysts pre-MBA. Again, you only need one person to say yes, but the degree of difficulty is, is quite high. You just need to understand that going in. And Emily, what, what, what were your, some of your thoughts? You know, you've had so much exposure to the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Yeah. You know, would your advice be, guys, don't even look at investment banking. Don't even look at private equity. You need to start a company or you know, given your, your background. I wouldn't what- say that. Yeah, I wouldn't say that. I think a lot of, I'll say this more from a lot of the founders that I've worked with. I think there is a lot, and I, I think this will sort of um, c- convey to this conversation. I think there is so much benefit in having operational experience, um, especially post MBA or just transitioning from the military. Um, and just learning and, and forming as many relationships. And I want to say making mistakes on other people's dimes. That's not really the, the, the tone, but it's like just being in the presence of other, other entrepreneurs and other operators, that is not wasted effort. I feel like a lot of folks, there, there's a lot of almost like bravado around starting something is immediately after you get out. And I actually think it's good to take some time to get exposure to other people's experience, not just from like the actual startup side, but the op side and just all the functional areas of a company, managing people again, you know, knowing who to hire, like all of that stuff that really is just sort of like, you sometimes just have to live it and see it. And if you're lucky enough to join a company where you have exposure to that, I I can't say enough good things about it as you're sort of knowing, okay, I'm gonna make that phase. Now the, the real challenge is like making the leap, right? And knowing when to do that. But I feel like any, like to Sherman's point even, anytime you can get operational experience, um, you know, at, at that phase of your career, like I always support that. Awesome. Uh, Mark, what about you? 
leaving the military, when I looked at school as a potential option, there was a tried and true path of junior officers getting out, going to get their MBAs, that I was kind of at the point that I was looking at the options in front of me and figured, I don't know much about business, might as well just join a business to figure out the operations of what is, what is biz dev, what is sales, what is marketing, how do you, what is product? And chose the academic option to knock the rust back off, get a different peer set and expanded worldview. And through school, I had been going down a commercial real estate route, various investing roles. Turns out that industry is kind of on fire right now. And with that pivot, I, I had over the last uh, about nine months looked back into these other veins that I was interested in pulling on these different threads. And that led me this summer looking into kind of the venture, the startup, uh, getting a little bit of that operational experience. But really, when I look forward 20 years, it's I see an investment holding company of some fashion of my own. So um, I had been looking for kind of that earlier stage exposure and seeing exploring different models, whether it's venture studio, startup studio, or kind of this, this angel type investing. Uh, but question for the two of y'all is, you know, as either MBA grads or service members transitioning out is when, when they see all these roles and the options available to them, what, what should they be thinking about for, you know, is this just something very sexy and shiny or is this something that I'm actually going to like and yeah. like ways for them to think through that? Yeah. So sure, I'll, I'll start and then I'll hand it over to you. I think, I think two things, you sort of touched on something that I think is really important with respect to any long-term decision-making, which is like, what do I get most excited and enthusiastic about? Because it's a marathon, not a sprint. And so making that decision with like, what is going to help my, like, what, what am I genuinely going to be the most enthusiastic about over the long term? Um, I'm always a big fan of what can I genuinely form the best relationships through in the long term as well. So I think we've all been in like a short term sprint where you sort of put your life on pause, but I think that that's a piece of advice. I just see too often people sort of put their lives on pause and then look up and they're like, wait, what have I done? So relationships and the long term piece. And, uh, and, and I, I think with respect to um, the, the third point is um, who is your team kind of going back to my point earlier. So like, who else do you need around you with respect to these decisions? And I think that's why going back to school is always a great option. So what roles would you need or who would you need to surround yourself with at this point to kind of go forward with that given your network? And can you use your time in school um, to try and find those people and sort of round either yourself out or round out what that team might look like as you go forward? Um, whether it's for yourself or you know, working for somebody else as you gain more exposure. Mr. Sherman, I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, I think for you, you need to figure out the earlier, life is not fair, right? And the earlier you figure out what you want to do, the easier things will be for you because then you can start to accumulate those skill sets to, to do well in that battle space, if you will, right? You need to go out and grab some skill sets. The other thing too, is you want to be somewhere where you can learn pretty quickly. And you want to be somewhere where people are patient enough to actually teach you. Because like Zach said, uh, for us military folks, we're all a little bit older. We're all, most of us are going to be, because like no one's getting out this year, right? <laughs> Very few people are probably. So we're all going to be early to mid thirties when we're getting out. Um, so I do think we, we, and we need to realize we can't do everything. We can't take necessarily the same path that that 26 to 28 year old that's been working for the last four to six years in New York City or San Francisco, and is going to get their MBA, we can't necessarily take the same path as them. Our journey, our journey is for sure, you know, just a little bit different. So those are a couple of things I think that, that you need to think about. And if you, for, the, for the venture studio model, uh, different from Zach with private equity, venture is, a, the, the aperture is much wider as far as who can get into venture. There's not really these set, there's not really these set paths you know, like Emily said, a great thing to do is to maybe go to a startup, right? Get some operational experience. Um, you can always, there's so many things you can do now where you can invest in deals on the side, put in just small amounts of money in via Angels List, via Academy Investor Network. You can start your own little syndicate. There's so many ways. I, I encourage people who want to get into venture. First of all, if you're a category grad, please join AIN. Even if you're not, 
just come, just contact me. And I just think starting investing in deals on your own and getting those reps is the right way to start getting uh, into venture. Venture Studio is a fantastic option because you're getting the finance piece and you're getting uh, you're getting the, the the company building piece, right? By doing these sprints as you as you you know churn through ideas of companies to start. Um, so the aperture is a little bit more open mark for that, but for you, it's really just finding that one person uh, to say yes. I think that in venture early on, you're gonna work for free a lot right? Just kind of getting your feet wet, just people building rapport with you, et cetera. But eventually, eventually we'll crack. I've seen people with differentiated backgrounds have a lot of success in venture relative to private equity. It's kind of just like this set path that, that's out there. And I think that makes me think of looking at how you allocate your time, like many seed investments in your future. And the amount of free work that I've had to do for the past two years, it's just saddening. But now, <laughs> but now two years later, that's starting to pay dividends because of the relationships that we have built and doing a ton of free work for people just to prove that we have something that they could be interested in. Um, so I think, I, I, mean, I, I really like you know your advice on just, or actually both of you guys, your advice on just focus on learning especially if you have a little more risk appetite, just find someone who's doing a lot of interesting things, learn as much as you can. Um, but in one of my biggest mistakes, I think in, in entrepreneurship is trying to do a square peg in a round hole with an idea. You're like, oh no, I know this will work. But have you actually experienced the pain of this? Nope. I never did a single debt deal until I started debt maven like a year into it. I wasn't scratching my own itch. Um, now it's kind of worked out like four years later, do a deal, one or two deals a year, but I would not have done it again in, in retrospect, just because I wasn't scratching my own itch. And, and that goes back to what I was saying before is whatever you do, you're doing, you have to be very thoughtful and passionate about it. Because, you know, if you would have plugged a debt maven for another five years, who knows what would have happened. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You just, I mean, eventually people could just get tired and they give you business. You know, I think it, it's a, it's table stakes uh, as far as passion uh, for the idea that you're trying to push forward. If you're an entrepreneur. Can I add one more point too? I think it's hard to, with folks who especially have had a lot of success throughout their life to sort of battle entitlement as we get older. Mm -hmm. Like I've done all these things. I'm supposed to sort of be good at it and sort of, like reconciling that you're at the bottom of a learning curve and it's hard at that point. Um, but there's like no better time to do it in this structure of a startup because there isn't sort of that traditional rank and structure file of the military. So I find the folks that really going back to Sherman's like the learning, they embrace that sort of like freedom. They're the ones that I think really thrive out, outside of the military on that side of um, on that side of life with a startup, where they're really curious and learning, and sort of not feeling entitled to be successful as a result of their past, but they do have the confidence. That's another thing that's table stakes is you have to have complete ego suspension coming in the military. I have two friends. One was a fighter pilot. The other one was a Green Beret. They'll probably know who I'm talking about if they ever see this. And they just chafed at, uh, <laughs> you know, being in banking and having a 23 year old be like, hey, this, this thing is messed up, you know, da, da, da. And, you know, guys are like, dude, really? Um, it, it just wasn't necessarily, you know, for them. It, it, they, they found it to be difficult. Um, they all, they ended up actually being quite successful doing something else. They ended up not, not, not staying in banking. Um, but, you know, it's really key that you just kind of completely fall back and you're like, I'm just, I'm just here to learn. Right. And it's some of the banks, man, some of the people will be like, Hey, you know, Hey man, you're, you're going to come here, be an associate. You're probably not going to make VP. You're probably not going to be a director. Almost no one makes MD or people, most people will try not to make MD, right. They try to get out of banking way before that. Um, you know, be willing in the, in the beginning, like my banking, you know, analogy or any other thing, just to go and just learn for a couple of years. You don't necessarily have to do it forever. Right. Um, and yeah, we are in our mid thirties and I know I was in a rush uh, and, and shame on me for being like that. You know, thirties is not old. It's just not like if you, if you spend, you know, 24 to 36 months post military, post MBA uh, working somewhere, just learning, there's nothing wrong with that. 
Um, and, I, and I would I would say, you know, do that to really then figure out, you know, what you want to do. That's awesome. Guys, really appreciate your time with this. And hopefully we can shoot episode two a year from now when you have <laughs> doubled or tripled in size. Exactly. <laughs> awesome. Thanks Raise so much. Raise the fun at that point. Raise the fun. That's the, that's the hope. There we go. <laughs> Thanks, Jordan. Bye. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Thanks guys.